Welcome back to my channel. This is the last episode in the Tectonic Processes and Hazard series. Thank you so much for coming along with me on this journey, but don't worry, this is not the end of the geography content on my channel. I'm going to be starting another series on a different topic within the next couple of weeks, so subscribe for that. Turn on the notification bell so you don't forget about it. Today we're going to be talking about managing the impact of tectonic hazards. This is still inquiry question three and it's a long one, so grab yourself a cup of tea, grab yourself a post-it note, write down what you learn. So let's get into this video. Managing hazard events. Hazard management is important due to the lack of reliable ways to predict them. Hazard management generally focuses on key players involved in hazard mitigation. These strategies are meant to avoid, delay or prevent hazards, such as land use zoning, diverting lava flows, GIS mapping, and hazard restriction design and engineering, or hazard adaption. These are strategies designed to reduce the impacts of hazard events, such as high tech monitoring, crisis mapping, modeling hazard impacts, public education, and community preparedness. Government hazard mitigation strategies. Number one, land use zoning. This is a process by which local government planners can regulate how land in a community may be used. In areas at risk from volcanic eruptions and tsunami, land use zoning is an effective way to help protect people and property. Land use planners make maps to make decisions about the appropriate use of land in each zone, as well as preparatory tasks, such as determining evacuation routes. In areas at high risk from volcanic eruptions and tsunamis, any settlements tend to be limited, if they're allowed at all, Certain types of structures and facilities are completely prohibited, such as those that pose a high risk if damaged, such as nuclear power stations, as we saw in Fukushima in 2011, or those that are critical for a community, such as hospitals. Some communities may actually be resettled. Development in areas that provide natural protection will also be limited. This is common in wealthier countries, but it is a lot less common in developing countries. The second strategy is diverting lava flows. Historically, diverting lava flows has been attempted to divert lava flows away from people and communities. These methods have included building barriers and digging channels to try and divert the flows into safer directions. While these methods have led to some successes, such as the barriers that led the flow of the 1983 eruption in Mount Etna in Italy, in general they've been fairly ineffective as the path taken by lava is hard to predict, it's difficult to know where to build walls or dig channels. The terrain has to be suitable, a downward slope so that the lava can slip away, and stopping the lava from flowing towards one community may actually push it towards another. The third strategy used by the government is GIS mapping. It can be used at all stages of the disaster management cycle. It can show the locations and rough sizes of major towns and cities, it can show the locations and rough population sizes of major towns and cities, the areas affected, and the locations able to get aid in and out. The fourth strategy is hazard resistant design and engineering defences. Collapsing buildings are one of the main causes of death and damage by tectonic hazards. Designing and constructing buildings effectively is key to protecting lives and property. New buildings and structures can be designed to resist ground shaking during earthquakes. The roofs of houses near volcanoes can be sloped to reduce the amount of ash that builds up on them, which reduce the risk of them collapsing under the weight of the ash. Buildings at risk from tsunami can be elevated and also anchored to their foundation to stop them from floating away. And existing buildings can be modified, called retrofitting, to make them safer. Protective structures, such as sea walls or retaining walls, can be built to stop or slow the impact of tsunamis and landslides. Engineers study the impacts of tectonic events on structures and then develop them to make them safer. However, not all hazard resistant designs need to be expensive. Hazard adaption strategies. Hazard adoption is about acknowledging the hazard threat that involves reducing people's vulnerability to its impact. This involves activities at all levels. 
The first one we'll talk about is high-tech monitoring. Technological monitoring systems for volcanic eruptions, earthquakes and tsunamis allow scientists to learn more about these natural processes in the hope of being able to predict them more accurately and further in advance. GIS helps to create hazard maps that manage hazards more effectively. Early warning systems detect that volcanic eruptions or tsunamis are about to occur. The relevant authorities can then issue rapid alerts to communities at risk. Satellite communication technology helps to transmit the data from monitoring equipment so that early warnings can be used. And mobile phone technology is used to communicate rapid warnings and coordinate preparation activities. Number two, crisis mapping. Crisis mapping uses crowdsourced information as well as satellite imagery. Other maps and statistical models to accurately map areas struck by disaster. Now aid agencies are beginning to use crisis mapping before the disaster happens. The third one we'll talk about is modelling hazard impact. Computer models allow scientists to predict the impact of hazard events on communities. Information is fed into a computer and then they model the effects of the disaster. This allows scientists to compare the effects of different scenarios. They can be used by decision makers to help them develop plans and strategies to reduce their impact of hazard events and target resources more effectively. Number four, public education. Good education and public awareness can help to reduce vulnerability and prevent hazards from becoming disasters. It helps the public to know what they can do to protect themselves during and after a hazard event. This includes regularly practicing emergency procedures, encouraging households and workplaces to create emergency prepared kits, and building effective educational materials, such as information on constructing buildings to withstand earthquakes. Community preparedness and adaption. People living in vulnerable communities are often best placed to develop suitable preparedness plans and educate local residents. This is especially true when it comes to low-income communities. This tends to be the most effective when it is formalised, so the efforts can be ongoing and coordinated. Community preparedness activities include creating a list of vulnerable people who may need special assistance, organising practice evacuation drills and providing first aid courses. In some countries, governments provide help to communities to develop preparedness plans and activities. Key players in managing loss. During the recovery and response period of the hazard management cycle, efforts focusing on helping communities with personal, social and economic loss. The role of aid donors. Most countries struck by disasters receive aid, which is split into three stages. Emergency aid, such as food, clean water and shelter. Short-term aid, such as restoring water supplies, providing temporary shelter, etc., or longer term aid, which is things like reconstructing buildings, redeveloping the economy, infrastructure, and managing programs, reducing the impact of hazard events in the future. Aid can be provided as cash, personnel, equipment, services, and it can be distributed straight to the government, which it then uses to manage the disaster recovery operation, or be controlled directly by aid agencies or foreign governments. Many organisations provide aid, including governments, intergovernmental organisations and non-governmental organisations. The role of non-governmental organisations. They are especially important in disasters where the government doesn't respond or doesn't have the resources to do so. They can provide funds, coordinate search and rescue efforts and help develop reconstruction plans. Many are involved in all stages of the hazard management cycle. The role of insurance in hazard management. Natural disasters are expensive. The economic cost can be staggering. Insurance coverage helps communities to rebuild from disasters. It provides individuals and businesses with the money needed to repair and rebuild. Yet in many countries, few people have insurance for tectonic hazards. In some developed countries such as Japan, Governments and insurance companies work together to provide insurance for economic losses from disasters. The role of communities in managing loss. When disaster strikes, it is the local people who are the first to respond, who often play an important role in the community's recovery. They are crucial in the immediate search and rescue efforts. It can take days or weeks for aid teams to arrive, so local people have to undertake the recovery steps themselves. Community groups are also often involved in longer term strategies for rebuilding and improving resilience. 
So finally, we're gonna to come to the case study of NGOs and the 2005 Pakistani earthquake. A 7.6 magnitude earthquake struck Southeast Asia. Pakistan administered Kashmir were badly hit. 73,000 people died, including 17,000 children. 128,309 people were injured and 3.5 million people were left homeless. Roads, water, sanitation facilities and communication systems were all destroyed. The areas affected were largely mountainous, which made both search and rescue and longer term reconstruction a lot more difficult. NGOs responded immediately by providing over 500,000 tents and 6 million blankets. They provided safe water for over 700,000 people. They provided food and emergency clothing and emergency medical care. After the immediate needs were met, short term aid activities took over. More permanent shelters were being built water supplies were re-established and roads closed by landslides were rebuilt or rerouted. In 2007, two years after the earthquake, most NGOs moved from relief operation to recovery phase. Over the next five years, new schools, medical centres and homes were all built. Community-based disaster risk reduction programmes were also developed. And that is it for this tectonic hazards and processes series. I'm so glad you've come along. I'm so glad we've been here together. In the description box, there is going to be this whole booklet of notes, which I've just talked through for this series. I made this myself when I was doing my A-levels. Feel free to download it, it's completely free. I'd really appreciate it if you subscribed. There is going to be another geography series coming from me within the next two weeks. I don't know when I'm gonna start it. I might take a week off if I can. Um, but yeah, there's going to be another geography series from me, so please subscribe, like this video, and thank you so much for getting to this point, I really appreciate it, and I will see you in my next video. There's another video going up next, on Thursday at 4.30pm, and either next week or the week after, on Monday, there'll be another geography related video at 4.30, so I will see you then. Bye guys, thank you so much. <laughs>